Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to watch this. Maybe we should have rehearsed this first. Let me try this. I'm coming back here. Share screen. I'm going to try to share my first screen. Oh, you know what? I think I know what it is. Um, it's the resolution of my screen. I'm going to have to change that. Just give me a second. For what it's worth, I found sharing the window rather than the whole screen is often more reliable. Mm, okay. Um, let me just try this. I mean, I did this before, so it's a matter of... Uh... Okay. I just wanted to say real quick, Leo, I uh, picked up your book and I'm looking forward to going through it. Uh, we're talking about the Pigs Inside book? Yes, yes. Okay. Now I'm going to do some application. Let's see. Let's go. I think I got it. Hopefully. Do you guys see like a few stars on the screen? Okay. Hello world. Nod your head. Good. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll try to remember for next time. I just have to change the, the resolution of the screen. So um since we all see some photographers, astrophotographers, astronomers, visual astronomers, and everything, um, we all know that if we were to look not tonight, but on a clear night um, from the city, we will probably see at best a few stars in the sky. If we get out of the city lights and then go to what we usually call dark sites, then we start to see more stars in the sky. However, if we had like a super, super vision, we would be able to see what's really out there, um, which is definitely a lot more than just a few uh, points of light. So how can we see what's there? It's this thing called astrophotography. It's what we do to see what's uh, up there. What is astrophotography? Well, astro, which means stars, and then photography, which means photography, taking pictures. So astrophotography is basically taking pictures of the stars. Now, after we've gone through this um, extremely complex explanation of astrophotography, I'm going to talk to you about astrophotography in general um, as it was happening to me, and we're gonna be covering a lot of different things. And one of the first things that I like to say first is not about my taste in soda, but that I do mostly, as John uh, pointed earlier, two kinds of photography. One is what I call nightscapes, and the other one that's usually called deep sky photography. So, what are nightscapes? Well, nightscapes are images that contain stars, usually the Milky Way, not necessarily, 
and that also contain a piece of land, something that, you know, something earthy, something that we relate to. Uh, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later on the presentation. And what is deep sky photography? Well, deep sky photography is usually we use a telescope to, this is a slide that is not working, so I'll go to the next. Um, the image that we saw yesterday, where we actually take pictures of galaxies, nebulas, and other objects like comets. So there are two different kinds of photography. They require different techniques, different approaches, um, but they're both really astrophotography. So right now, um, I would say I have a wall full of little awards. There's, uh, there's actually a live um, exposition of my work in the uh, Madrid Planetarium. It's been there for uh, almost three years already, two years or so, um, with backlit images, you know, large images, as you can see in that picture, which is really cool. Um, I've taken photographs of things that were, have not been photographed before. Um, uh, I have this gallery, which is actually from where I am uh, doing this video right now, um, but how did this all happen? Um, there was a point, again, as John pointed out, um, that you know I didn't even know what astrophotography was. Um, so it all started, and I start, you know, do the analogy of a crossroad. Um, in one of the books that I've written, uh, that's Hawaii Nights, um, which basically is about the night sky in Hawaii, I start by saying, that life is what happens between the decisions we make. Um, so this is kind of what in, at which point in our lives we run into astronomy and that suddenly becomes a passion for, for all of us. Um, and it's, each one of us has their own story as it's happened. And should that not have ever happened, we might not be you know, in this meeting right now. So it's these little moments that sometimes really change our lives. I sound like an informational, but it's true and you know it. So how it, was, how it worked this for me? Well, this was 13 years ago. So that's 2007, if you do the math. I was going through the Pacific Coast Highway. This is, uh, you know, north of Big Sur. Um, we were with family. We were driving actually at night. Um, and then at some point, uh, this is a really dark sky area. If you're lucky that you don't have the marine layer running, as soon as you know, um, so at some point, uh, my wife opened the moon of the car, and then she went like, oh, wow, you have to go over, you have to see these so many stars. Um, so I listened to the wife, of course, what are you going to do, right? Um, so I pull over, I'm still, I still can't see because I'm blinded by the lights from, you know, from, from diving at night. Um, but within five minutes, uh, I look up, and I basically saw a sky that I've never seen in my life, the Milky Way, right? down to the, to the horizon in the ocean. Uh, so anyway, so the moment I saw it, I'm like, I need to take a picture of this. Um, and that is all I had with me, this little, you know, family, you know, trip, travel camera. Um, I had no idea how could I take a, uh, take a picture of that. Um, my first travel was how the hell am I going to focus in the middle of the night? I don't have a you know, focus reference point or anything. So anyway, I knew I had to do a uh, long exposure. That was like the only thing that I knew I, I needed to do. So I somehow managed um, to take a 30 second exposure, holding the camera. Um, this is what I did. Um, I did this picture of the Milky Way. Um, if you're looking at it now in a small screen, it may look okay, but actually it's pretty horrible. If you look at it up close, um, you may even notice that this is actually three pictures put together. Uh, my camera only had that field, much field of view, so I took a picture, then I put it a little higher and a little higher. So my first astrophotography was actually a mosaic, which is kind of interesting because, you know, fast forward a few years later, I'm doing some extremely huge mosaics, so that was kind of funny. So... There were some challenges. One thing that I knew the moment that I took that picture is I knew I, I need to know, you know, if somebody like me can, can do these pictures that I've seen on the internet. This is again, 2007. There were not as many images out there on the internet as there are today, um, but there were certainly uh, quite still, uh, quite still a few from Hubble and whatnot. And I was wondering, 
Does anybody, you know, a normal person like myself can do these kind of pictures? Um, so the next day I went on to the internet and I started Googling and astrophotography. Um, um, I was hooked ever since. Um, however, there were some challenges back then. Um, right now um, you can find, you know, many people offering classes, workshops, tutorials. Um, there's tons of web forums on the internet. Um, again, tons of t video tutorials that you can uh, you know, Google and find, you know, from how to set up your equipment to how to, you know, do the strategy about your photography session, how to do the post processing and whatnot. You know, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, but back then there was really not much of it. So um, you didn't really know where you were going to end up. This is a slide that I never remember why I chose this slide. Um, but I'm sure it's related. <laughs> So anyway, um, so there was a, uh, there were a lot of challenges uh, back in the time, um, and then we enter what I call the silent walk. Um, what I mean by this is, so I learned that I want to do astrophotography. Uh, I mean, again, I'm telling my story as it may relate to some of you right now in the past or maybe in the future. So I learned I wanted to do these. Um, so I started to learn and I'm doing things, and you know, I started to add things to my life that were not there before, certainly. Um, I started to pay attention to the lunar calendar, something I <laughs> never paid attention in my life before than that. I look at the weather reports in a different way. I just wanted to be clear. Um, suddenly I found myself driving at night a lot, uh, you know, to dark sides, uh, which if you live in the Bay Area, you know, it probably usually starts more like that. Um, when I was then, you know, the feeling of arriving at the, at, at your, you know, the dark side that you, that you selected, um, setting up your gear, um, getting everything rolling, um, you know, basically being under the stars, and of course, star parties. Um, so a kind of event that, you know, I didn't even know it existed before. Um, so all this suddenly starts to become part of my life, and I'm sure, you know, most of you can relate to that. Um, but and then this is all happening uh, you know, behind the curtain. Uh, I'm not a astrophotographer whose work everybody knows. So you're learning and you're doing your things and you're doing your city uh, photography, uh, you know, pictures and whatnot, and you're learning. Um, and there's one thing that I learned fairly quickly. Again, this is more about, um, yeah, 13, 12, 13 years ago. Um, now things will be a little bit different. Um, but one thing that I learned back then is that if I wanted to do better astrophotography, I would stay away from using DSLRs and I would go directly to a CCD camera. Again, the situation today, it's a lot more uh, debatable. Um, but back then when I switched from a DSLR to a CCD camera, my images changed from, from, like from day to night. It was a completely different experience. Um, I didn't go for a typical first telescope many people buy at Walmart or Costco, um, but I went for a Takahashi telescope, just what I heard. I saw pe uh, pictures of people. What are, what are these people using? Oh, a Takahashi telescope. I'll get that. And I got my uh, Takahashi telescope and mount. And not only I love that telescope so much, talk about spending a lot of money on hardware, um, but basically I still keep that first telescope that I had, and now I have a twin one next to it. Um, so I am one, you know, one of those who has followed, you know, I got my gear and rather than keep upgrading my gear, one of the things that I heard at the beginning a lot was, oh, these are like very short focal length uh, telescopes. So that's very easy astrophotography. As you get into longer focal length, then you're going to see what real astrophotography is like. And while I don't argue the point of how much more difficult long focal length, focal length astrophotography is, um, in my case, what I did was stick to what I had and basically try to push it, you know, as much as I, I possibly could. Um, and part of that involved actually getting, you know, two telescopes instead of one, so I could gather twice the amount of time. But I'm getting ahead. We were talking about the this silent world process um, phase. Um, so after that, it comes the curiosity uh, aspect of these. And what I mean by that is, um, there's a point um, where what you do uh, in terms of learning uh, the technical aspects of it, the, again, the, the strategies for capturing your data, 
um, the post processing, which is extremely important if you want, you know, impressive results, if you will. Um, once you have that, when that becomes a tool as opposed to a challenge, um, then you have a, a lot more freedom to focus on other things as opposed to, and I want this picture to look better. If you have the tools, if you know what it takes, then, then you can get a little further. Um, so then I started to look at astrophotography in a way that made me a little bit more, um, I don't know, fulfill might be the word. Um, so, uh, and one way that I like to talk about this is talking about a different perspective of doing astrophotography. Again, we're talking about 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, so uh, there's a lot of these that you may see now that it wasn't there before. So the different perspective that I, that I want to talk about is say, uh, and if you have seen some of my old presentations, you may be familiar with this. So we go to Paris and we take a picture of the Eiffel Tower. So we might take a picture that looks like this, or a picture that looks like this, or like this. Now, these are beautiful souvenirs, but there's one thing that these pictures are not. They're not memorable in the sense of they represent a memory for you, but they don't have anything in themselves that will make them memorable. Uh, we can try to get a little bit more out of the you know, stock photo of the Eiffel Tower and shoot something like this. Not just because it's at night, but it's slightly different than the others. It starts to have a little bit more I don't know, personality, if you will. Um, this one with the, with the moon next to it, it starts to have a little bit of composition. Um, another one with some phantoms in the foreground, you start to give it a different feeling. Um, this is actually uh, my favorite out of the ones that we've been showing um, for the mood and the feeling, you know, the, the, the wet floor uh, from maybe the rain, uh, the merry-go-round, the Eiffel Tower right there, the cloudy sky. I tell people, you are seeing this picture today in this presentation, and if you see this picture two years from today, you're gonna to remember it. You may not remember it, you saw it in this presentation, but you'll be like, yeah, I've seen that picture before. Whereas the ones that we showed before, you know, especially at the beginning, you know, they don't have anything in them. Um, so here's a few other examples, you know, getting a little bit out of the ordinary with, you know, the same object. Um, this is actually one that uh, won some prize uh, somewhere. So now we go and we move this concept into astrophotography. So if we Google uh, for you know, images in Google for the Pleiades, you get some, we get something like this. Um, and we get here is actually that, yeah, they're not all the same, um, but at the same time, they are all the same. Um, different colors, different you know, focal lengths and sizes, brighter, not so much brighter um, but there's you know there's nothing in that pick the images that will you know get some personality if you will in them um, so when I went to take a picture of the Pleiades um, I actually looked at the Pleiades so the California Nebula wasn't far off so I'm like well let's try to put these two together and, and I'm looking now at a composition because is one thing that we cannot do in astrophotography with the Eiffel Tower you know, we can wait for the weather to change to get, you know, maybe you know, some fog or clouds or, you know, different angles. We cannot do any of those things in Astrophoto. We have the same canvas, um, you know, for all of us, it's the same. Um, so it's more about, you know, playing with the framing mostly and the scale. Um, so basically I had a different view. It's the same object. It's, you know, there's more to it. Um, but, you know, it starts to have a little bit of, you know, a difference. You know, it became more interesting for me to go for images like this than just another image of the player. There's no matter how deep or no matter how, how much is my image, therefore I like it. Um, a different one, this one is the player is on the left and then all the way to the higher, this with Aldebra and the star there and a few brownie clouds in the way. Um, so again, just different ways of looking at, you know, what we have up there to give it a, a new element of, of, of composition and framing perspective. Um, and maybe a few more things as we'll see. So now for, a, for a, a closer example to the Eiffel Tower example. So we look at, for example, the Witch Head uh, Nebula. So this is an image of the Witch Head Nebula. It's another one, another one. So again, the object is there, usually in the middle, that's what it is. 
Now this image, which I believe is from uh, uh, Jerry Rodriguez, I should have put the pictures on it. Um, so it's not mine. Um, it starts to have a little bit more composition and it's still, as I call it, the object in the middle. This works for a catalog type of uh, picture. Um, but it starts to have a little bit uh, something in it that I like. Um, when I went to photographic, never mind that strange background color. This is picture is from 2008 or 2009. Um, and I do agree that I don't know exactly what happened with the color, but in terms of composition, um, it's completely different from the ones that you know we've seen before where you have not. So that we just have nebulized on the side that may or may not be that good. I don't like the fact that the hat of the witch's head is touching the frame. But the thing is that when I went for this particular framing, I didn't even know there was that big hat on, on, on the witch's head. And I didn't know exactly how far it would go. So, uh, you know, I did whatever I could. And so it's there kind of like staring at, at Rachel. So there's composition elements that suddenly make the, you know, the image slightly different. Another example would be that I, that I like to share. This is the Blue Horse's Head Nebula. Uh, so this is one image of it. Um, this is how it would look at it. We had, you know, north is up, so it's kind of like upside down. Um, this is another image of the same object. Now they kind of, you know, uh, 180 degrees, so it starts to look more like a, you know, some animal's head, whether it's a horse or something else. Um, and then when I went for it, then we had a similar concept as the one before, where the horse's head, where the horse seems to be staring at a star. So then there's, there's you know, different composition elements um, that were absent uh, in most of the astrophotography that was being done at the time. Um, so this is actually the only slide that I have with a lot of text in it, um, where it says, you know, what I mentioned earlier in astrophotography, we all share the same canvas and we just take photos of tiny parts of it. There is no other way. And then I joke because I'm like, did you say tiny? Because <laughs> sometimes, you know, we aim at a framing that is so large that it's anything but tiny. Um, but anyway, so here now we have the California Nebula, the Pleiades, all the way to Sinus 147, Flame Star Nebula, and the whole Taurus molecular cloud in the middle, or the whole, uh, you know, Orion. Which there's an interesting story about this image, because I did this image of the whole constellation of Orion. This is a six by seven mosaic. Um, and I did this image in 2010. Um, at the time, uh, I think it was the first image of the whole constellation of Orion at telescopic resolution on that. Um, so, you know, I got a lot of press and, you know, I got, you know, of course I got the A-pod and, uh, and, and whatnot. Um, but while I was getting all that praise from, you know, friends and family and whatnot, in my head I knew this picture, it, you know, there's a lot of things that are not, I'm not going to say wrong with it, but that could be greatly improved. And at some point, somebody is going to do it. Um, and then 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, I mean, 2015, um, nobody had still done another image of the whole constellation of Orion at telescopic resolution and depth, but I wanted to see it. And since I wanted to see it, then I went for it. <laughs> Um, so I did the whole thing again. Now, so this is the one that I did five years later. You may like this one more, the other one more. Um, we're not going to get into that discussion here. Um, but for me, it was about I want to see another attempt. Um, yeah, since nobody was doing it, I'm like, well, I'll do it again. And this is not, you know, spending a couple of nights in the Torah. This is actually, this is a seven by seven mosaic. So it's 49 frames in it. Um, but this is another thing that I also wanted to mention, which is, um, so all this curiosity, which is what's really driving a lot of my photography, um, really it's not so much about the likes or the Instagram success or, or, or anything like that. It's about, I want to see, first, I want to see the view. And second, I want to see how far can I go as far as getting the view, uh, you know, uh, made. So, um, this is really one of the things that, you know, has been driving a lot of the things that I've done. Another thing that I, that, you know, was clearly one of my interests was faint that dust, trying to photograph all that dust that it barely appears in other images, um, but I want to see it. Um, and that's the curiosity kicking. Um, and I will tell you, uh, 
not so big of a secret about as far as you know pulling this much dust out of you know uh, faint dust because uh, it's one of the things i guess one of the signatures of some of my images and many people oh, how do you do it um well there's there's three ingredients and the first one is enough exposure um you're not going to get this kind of data with two three four five six hours so for at, at the minimum 15 20 30 hours exposure secondly um do it from good skies uh, not average skies but good skies uh i have gone to image uh a, a dark side and if the sqm was 21.2 or less rather than working on a you know faint stuff project i will do other things and wait for a better night to get my data so those are the two main ingredients if you have those two the third one is processing um, but processing only goes so far. So many people think it's all in the processing and there's a lot of it in the processing, um, but you need good ingredients first. Uh, so, you know, if you want to go really deep, just do a lot of hours, you know, I'm from good skies. There's, there's not a lot, you know, a lot of secret recipe about doing that. So with all this curiosity and all these goals and all these things that, you know, were interesting me, then comes the out and about thing, which is like, oh, you start to be, popular within the astrophotography community, which is not really been popular at all. Um, but your work starts to be seen by a lot more people. And you know, what do you do when, 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 when that happens, if that happens? Um, so for me, it really started with the APOC. Um, this was not my first APOC. Um, there's not a picture of the day, but definitely from moving in a couple of web forums about astrophotography, um, to having my images going into the APOD. Well, many people were like, hey, you know, they were, they were paying attention to, to these images that incorporated some of these elements that I mentioned before in terms of composition and faint dust and whatnot. Um, so one of the elements that, I'm, as I mentioned, this is a place I used to go to do astrophotography, not anymore. Um, you know, you want to, you know, you want to have, it helps if you have, let me say it this way, it helps if you have a place that you can go comfortably. I've done a lot of nomadic uh, astrophotography, meaning I load my stuff on my car, I drive to, you know, top of a dark hill, you know, two hours away from home, and I do it there all night long and then drive back. Um, it will help a lot on any of your goals, whatever they are, if you have uh, a place. If it's just, uh, you know, a trailer that, that, you, you know, that you pull or, or anything, that's enough. Um, but really just going out in the wild it it's it puts a toll on your body uh, and, uh, we're not getting any younger um, so that's one of the things that helped me you know solidify my, my astrophotography being able to do this more comfortably um, then me out and about also implied that then suddenly people wanted to know what i was doing and how i was doing it so then you know you get called into doing talks if this is not something you like doing um, then you don't do it <laughs> Uh, however, uh, if your photography starts to be noticed somehow, you are going to be called. Um, and how comfortable you are with that or not, and well, that's something that I think experience unfortunately goes with it. Um, so with all this, now uh, I go into this site, this space called Horizon. So, you know, you have your astrophotography all worked out, you, you know, the, the technology is not a problem, processing is not a problem. Um, people start to expect things from you, which, but you're still going to whatever, you know, your personal goals are. And then I ran into what I mentioned earlier, nightscapes, uh, taking images with a DSLR camera and camera lenses, not pointing just at the sky, but at some piece of land going with a white pillar in the sky. And this was in 2012, and I started to do a lot, a lot. It was like going from not having a single nightscape to producing more than 200 in a single year, um, which it was also great living here in California because we have such amazing places just a few hours uh, from here. Some of them you know, right now going through some of the fires. Um, but, you know, I feel fortunate. Uh, for that, you know, it's not what, like I say, some people in the UK, they need to leave the country so that they can see the Milky Way. Um, that might be an exaggeration, but it's not too far off. Um, so doing nightscapes, one of the things that I immediately uh, champed on was a, a project that I mentioned earlier called Hawaii Nights, which again, 
um, basically was a project of taking, uh, you know, doing a, a photographic documentary of the night sky in all of the islands of Hawaii, um, which we all relate Hawaii to great skies, Mauna Kea, the observatories and whatnot. And there's certainly, you know, there, there were some images of, of Hawaii at night, but I felt that there were not. No, that all the islands were not represented. And this actually implied a very careful planning going from one island to another. I did this one, you know, on the ferry, on the plane, hotels, uh, rental cars and whatnot. So it was a complex uh, comp uh, project to carry this, you know, in, a, in an orderly fashion while I was not sleeping any of the nights during, what was it, like uh, 13, 14, 15, not 21 days trip. I don't remember. Anyway. Um, so this project gave birth to this book, Hawaii Nights. Uh, now that I mentioned the book, um, it's a good time to introduce a topic that sometimes people ask me about, which is like, okay, so Australia. So you probably better than many can tell me, can you make money out of astrophotography? So I would laugh really loud as I hear the question inside. <laughs> um, it's really tough. Um, and I will tell you the main, uh, you know, revenue sources that, that you can find here. Um, one, books. I write books. I sell books. Books will not keep you alive. Books are a work of passion. If you want to make money out of books, you will need to sell thousands, thousands of them. And that's not going to happen with a, a book about astrophotography. I mean, you can sell a few thousand but not uh, not enough to you know to become this uh stream of any kind um prince prince if you can sell prints of the andromeda galaxy for people to put in the living room i would like to see that picture because it's really tough prints of night sky photography do sell pretty well but prints of deep sky you can try certain you know markets like offices and whatnot uh, and some you know passionate people who would put one in their bedroom um but it's not normal um so if you're doing you know mostly deep sky photography you'll sell some prints but um you know it won't be something that you're selling very often so again not a great source of revenue the margins are pretty good Teaching. This is what most people do. And actually, I do have a problem with that because uh, and I hope people can tell me if I don't teach well, this is not a classroom, so this is not an example of it. Um, because there's a lot of people who, uh, the moment they learn, uh, you know, the skill, and they think they're qualified for teaching. And there's a lot of really bad teaching out there, uh, whether it's astrophotography or just photography or, or many other things. Uh, it's definitely not enough to know, uh, you know, the skill um, to be a good teacher. Um, I've seen that sometimes myself, even when I'm teaching, that at some point I, I'm like, okay, I'm not doing this right. Um, and it, you know, so then, then, then you try to, to do it better. But basically my point is, if you wanna make money out of astrophotography by you know, offering workshops and whatnot, um, you might as well take a class first, you know, about you know, how to teach and how to communicate. Um, because, uh, you know, it's really important. It's, it's part of what you're doing. It's half of what you're doing. It's not just the knowledge of photography or photography. Um, and in the end, of course, as a very famous quote of uh, Mr. James Brown, he, he once said that the show business, he was talking about the show business, which he was in, um, is half show and half business. And that is true for any other business. If you want to run anything as a business, even if you start it as a hobby, um, then you're going to have to deal with everything that running a business uh, implies. It's not all about taking pictures and processing them and dealing with customers in, in, in getting the pictures to them or anything. There's, you know, there's everything else, you know, from inventory to the ledgers. Anyway, all that extremely boring stuff uh, for me, at least. Um, you can open a gallery, and actually I have one here in, in my own place, a private gallery. Um, but again, we're talking about the business of selling prints, which is, you know, iffy, unless you build a name out of yourself. That has nothing to do with the quality of your work. Um, so, and this is it. So if you can manage these things, you could make some money. Um, but that's pretty much it. If you have any ideas, I'll be glad to hear that. 
So with all that said, now um, we're going on to the last part of my presentation. And basically it's a quick uh, walk through some of my images uh, and a bit of commentary. Um, and my goal with this is not to talk, me talking about my images, um, but about seeing some of the perspectives and some of the approaches that I use so that, you know, if you do a software photography, you may want to try to, you know, incorporate that in, in, in the way that you approach software photography yourself. As I say, I don't tell people what to do. I just tell them what I do, and then you can take from there and then do it, you know, do with it whatever you want. So, out of all the images um, that I'm going to be showing you, this has to be the first one, because this was the first image that people really noticed from me. This is images from 2009, and you can already see that I am not going after uh, object in the middle type of image. I'm looking for a stellar view or a stellar landscape, if you will, with different objects. Um, I'm always looking for some sort of balance in the composition. Um, so, you know, definitely this was an eye opener even for myself. Um, in fact, this image started as, as two separate images. I wasn't going for a mosaic. I did one of the uh, Orion's Bell and one of them 42. And some, some a friend on a forum uh, told me, why don't you try to put them together? And there you go. Um, I mentioned this image before. Uh, and this image was my very first APOD, um, where again, composition, uh, plays a, a big volume in, in, in the image. This is another of my top images from my from my perspective. This is the Angel Nebula, first uh, photographed by Steve Mandel, also from a year from well, from Santa Cruz. Um, extremely famed dust uh, that I try to bring to life as much as possible. Um, very few images of this object. Again, it's one of the things that I've you know, been more passionate about is about you know trying to reveal what's difficult to reveal. You know, that's part of the, the challenge. Um, and again, we're talking about this is data from 21.5, 6.7 skies and about I don't know 18 hours at the, at the minimum of luminance. Um, um, You've seen this image earlier in the presentation. Uh, I call this the, mo the mother of all pretty pictures. Not my image in, in particular, but this view. Because um, it has everything but a nice galaxy. It has you know, reflection nebula, uh, emission nebula, so the uh, globular clusters, uh, all these colors, yellow, which is really rare in, in nebulosity in the sky. Um, and, I, and I show it because, again, it, it, it comes to show the composition element in here, there's several objects, actually the middle is kind of empty, there's nothing in it, um, but there's a kind of balance, you know, kind of like in a triangular type of, uh, you know, composition. Um, Orion constellation, I showed this picture before and I spoke about it earlier, so that's, there's not much more to say about it. Um, after I did this version, I took John Gleason's another Bay Area resident, um, HA data and, and I blend them together with this one and then that image is even more spectacular because there's a lot more H alpha uh, in the image. Not as, as, as vivid as in John's black and white image, um, but yeah, it definitely gained a lot. Um, now look at this image. So this image has uh, M78 on the left, um, a chunk of Barnard's loop in the middle, an uh, LBN one something, something, something. Um, but again, I'm looking here at the composition and the funny thing about this image is that I, let me use discovered in quotes, this composition. Um, well, I was looking at, let's see if it comes back, at the image of Orion. As I was looking at this image, I did notice that basically if you look at the area where M78 is, I kind of, I don't think I can point it myself. Um, actually, can I maybe with the mouse? Well, you know where it is, I'm seven yet. So I kind of like, so I don't know if you see my mouse, but anyway, I kind of like, so that area that could be a very good framing for, for a single image. And, and here it is. So you have an object on the left, an object on the right, something dividing. And then, you know, people actually come with a lot of different interpretations of what this could be. So again, you're, you know, adding a composition element to something that's already there. Um, scene is 147, I, we saw it before in a much wider field. Um, here, my goal was to go deep, um, not just, I mean, this object is huge and difficult already, but I also wanted to, you know, try to see what else could have, was, was in there. This is a, 
an image from 2011. And in my book, it's, uh, you know, it's long overdue to go for it again. Uh, from my perspective, just like I did with Orion. So I might go for that sometime soon. Um, this is another image. This is a, a California Nebula. Again, a lot of paint dust. This was actually a collaboration between me and three other guys. Um, so it was the first time that I actually was working in a big collaboration where data came from four different cameras and four different telescopes, which was an incredible nightmare. Uh, when we got all the data, we all decided to try, you know, give it a try to process uh, processing it. And there was only one version, which is the one that I did, because um, it was really a nightmare, uh, just for myself. So everybody was pretty much gave up trying to put it all together. Um, but it came out really nice. And uh, for me, it was definitely an experience. Uh, so that's why it's part of this little collection. Um, then this is the Milky Way. This is a 102 pane mosaic. So it's telescopic resolution. You cannot appreciate the detail on this slide, um, but this is a huge project that I undertook uh, between 2015 and 2018 or so. Um, you know, just taking more and more paints, not deep because this is the Milky Way, you know, near the core, so you know it's pretty bright. Um, but this is huge, and, and I've been trying to continue. Uh, it's just that it doesn't get as interesting for me as we go north. Anyway. Um, this Andromeda and the hydrogen clouds. This was uh, something that, you know, I was doing astrophotography. This was in 2017. I have been doing astrophotography for 10 years already. And there's a point that you, you know, things could get boring. And then you, you, you do something like this. And it's not about me doing it, but about, you know, even what it meant, you know, for astrophotography in the sense that, you know, we have one of the most imaged objects ever, you know, along with, you know, probably M42 and not, not many more. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy, and suddenly we see it in a view that we hadn't seen it before. Um, so this was like, you know, we just have to keep going. You know, this, you, know, you never know what's going to come up, you know, next time. We're not even talking about discoveries. This class, we're not a discovery. Uh, you know, uh, we knew that they were there, just we didn't know <laughs> they were going to be able to, we were going to be able to reveal them, you know, in like such a visible way. And then I showed this one before, mostly because it's a huge mosaic. Um, and I've been trying to make it bigger and bigger. Um, this is another image, and I'm going to give you a comparison. So we have M64 is the galaxy that we have there, kind of like near the middle. And then that kind of bar of dirty brownish cloud, um, that's again, extremely faint clouds that we hadn't seen in a photograph before. And here I'm going to show you a comparison this was 16 hours of luminance data. And then this next slide was eight hours of luminance data. From, again, from you know, really nice dark skies, 21.5 SQM or higher. Um, so look at it again. Just, I mean, of course, there's a lot more processing here uh, given to it. But, also be, but it's also because the data cannot like, allow me to, 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 to push it. If you go back here, you can see that you know, there's just structures that were not visible. So with that done, I'm going to wrap up with a few nightscapes, um, talk about them. Um, this is the only, actually, this is the one that if you saw my, so you see me behind, I have a print behind of this, um, this very image. This is probably, probably not, this is the only composite nightscape that I've ever done. I don't like to mix the Milky Way from one shot and the landscape from another. In this case, I did, even though I actually captured the Milky Way at the same time in the same night with a different telescope. Um, but uh, the bottom was done with a 20, well, it's a, at a 100 millimeter resolution. So actually, um, it's very detailed. This was one of my, one of the first nights that I went to do uh, nightscape photography at Glacier Point, Yosemite, of course, you know, you can't go wrong with that view. Um, but, but I do remember that as I was at other places around the area in Yosemite, I saw those clouds and I'm like, I hope those clouds don't screw me later. I didn't see them as lenticular clouds from my point of view. I just saw clouds and my fear was are they going to later cover the Milky Way and screw my images. And little I know that actually they were lenticular clouds, which of course, you know, they added this unique, you know, uh, uniqueness to this particular image. Um, 
this is just amazing. This is uh, the Kilauea uh, volcano on the big island of Hawaii. Um, we can see a little bit of Orion on the top left and uh, that little white spot near the middle top, that's the way it is. Um, but this is, uh, this was a night that, because this is, this crater, there's, it's always windy here. So all the fumes and everything, they're always going to one side. But that night there was, was still, and there was absolutely no wind. So everything was going up and it was just so apocalyptic that it was just, you know, I don't know, really, really, really impressive. We are about three, four images short, probably two before the end, so I just don't have an idea. Um, so let me tell you about this image. This is in the Eureka Dunes in, uh, in Death Valley, not the Mesquite Dunes. Those are the easy ones for tourists. This one, you actually, you know, you want to have a good suspension in your car to get there. Um, so, but let me tell you about this picture, because I'm on that picture, that little silhouette over there, it's me. Um, and people ask me, how would you, where are you, and I was alone. So people ask, how were you able to time yourself so perfectly? Because obviously you need to leave the camera ready and you need to walk all the way there without leaving footprints and whatnot. And then, so how could you, you know, time it so perfectly? And the answer, it's a very simple trick. You may, may not already, um, which basically is, I didn't, I didn't set a delay for the shot. I simply let the camera do the time lapse of 20 seconds each shot. So it would take a 20 second, then another, then another, then another, then another, and go on and so on. So basically I leave the camera there and then I go to my position. I already know where to go and how to go. I'm using my flashlight, I get to my position. And then once I get to my position, then I know that I need to stay still for about twice of my exposure times and to guarantee that at least one shot will come clean. And that's it. So you don't need, really need to time. Not only that, after you do one position, I mean, one pose, you could change the pose and try a different one. You could sit on the floor, you could raise up your arms, you could do, turn on your head, flash sliders, whatever, and try different shots, as long as you stay still for 40 seconds in this case, since the uh, exposures were 20 seconds. So that's just one thing that you need to do. You don't need to, you don't need to be specific about you know, time delay or anything like that. Um, this one is a little bit about perspective, because then this is something that I also started to play when I started to do nightscapes, you know, I didn't just want to take landscapes with the Milky Way, I, you know, I'm out there and, and you know, you want to have fun, you want to, it's not that you want to get creative for the heck of being creative, it's that, you know, you're just trying groupy things, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. So, you know, like we've all seen the road and the Milky Way in the end, and in this case, well, I decided to put the camera on the floor, <laughs> as opposed to on the tripod. Um, which gave a really cool feeling and even more than, you know, I tilted the angle, which I don't remember right now if this was by accident or, or, or in purpose, I honestly don't remember. Um, but it, you know, to me gave it, gave it a sense of, I don't know, speed or something. It's just, you know, silly little tiny things that, you know, you change a little and then, you know, it just moves a little away from the ordinary, if you will. So, you know, things, things do talk about doing goofy things. So, Basically, I'm showing here, this is not a composite. The Milky Way that you see in the mirror, um, it's actually, I mean, the camera is focused on the Milky Way on the mirror. Um, this is a 14 millimeter lens. So I actually was able to conserve the focus on the back, uh, you know, the, on the stars on the back. Um, and yeah, the Milky Way is being reflected in the mirror or in the rear view, because that's how it is. And actually I thought of this while I was waiting at school for my you know, picking up my daughter from school, and I was there sitting in the car, and I'm looking at the rear view mirror, you know, looking whatever it's reflecting, and then I came up, and, you know, and then I said, I'm like, you know what, maybe I could try to take a picture of a Milky Way on the rear view mirror, I need to park, you know, the car, and whatnot, you know, like I said, goofy little things, um, Milky Way reflections, reflected on a lake, reflected on a mirror, reflected on a puddle, just, you know, concepts, things that you can add to, to, to your composition. Of course, I had to goof around with those crystal balls. Um, to me, this was like the proof of concept type of shot. You know, can I actually focus on the fog? Which was extremely complicated. And I have to thank, in this particular case, the camera that I was using, which is the Sony A7A. No, yeah, A7, yeah, correct. Um, with A7S, excuse me. Um, which allowed me to actually see the dots of light from now going through the crystal ball on the LED of my camera behind, which with my Canon 
5D Mark you know, Mark II, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to see a thing. Um, so here the camera helped a little because you know achieving focus on the ball is really difficult. Uh, and you need to find a point because it's gonna be focused on one point but not on the size of the ball and whatnot. But yeah, and actually I came up, I mean I came up yeah, thought of this idea um, because some people were posting pictures of an app that took a picture and made a, an effect of going, you know, being seen through a bottle and through things like that, a do drop and whatnot. And I'm like, no, this is a real time basic app. Um, I show this picture because it's, you know, a mix of my two passions, nightscapes and deep sky photography. Um, Red Lake in uh, California, 88. Uh, really beautiful place, 8,000 feet of altitude, I think. Um, and probably the most beautiful place I've ever taken my telescope there, like, except Monarchy. <laughs> that, that's, 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 that's. Although, I don't know. What to do. Anyway. So um, I also share this image um, to talk about serendipity, to talk about, you know, just being in the right place, doing the right thing, and you don't even know why. Um, so I came, this is the famous 2017 eclipse, uh, that hopefully all of us saw one way or another. Um, and in my case, I was so, I don't even know what word to use, uh, absorbed into the experience of witnessing a total solar eclipse for the first time. I completely forgot that I had gear there ready for you know taking some some images. So in the last second I went to one, I took a picture of the eclipse, which is at the top of this image. Um, and I got that. And then I look at the L you know LCD of my camera and I'm like, you know, this is this is, this is all I'm gonna be able to do, you know, basically a black background and a tiny little black circle. So then I basically point the camera down and there was this girl there at the middle of the water all into the experience as well. And then I took this second shot as the sun was coming out of the tower, um, which caused this, you know, light of halo around her. Uh, so then I blended them both together. And I, you know, it was really, really pretty, but it was uh, something that, you know, a split second and I would have had. And it wasn't planned. It was, you know, totally by, you know, by chance. So sometimes this, this happens to us as well. Um, and this is my last image, uh, the famous Yosemite fire falls, um, but at night, um, which there's, there's actually quite a few stories behind, you know, this picture and what led to it. Um, I'll just mention it briefly. So basically we all know the craze about the fire falls in February in Yosemite, um, where the parking that they have to, you know, limit where people can go and whatnot. It's just crazy. Um, so while we were, you know, while we were going through one of these Februarys, uh, a friend of mine um, and I started talking about, you know, could this happen, you know, with the moonlight instead of the sunlight? If we catch the moonlight in the same position as it's setting, you know, a very big bright moon. Um, so we try to do calculations um, to see when could this happen. Then it's really tricky because when a full moon is setting, it means the sun is already coming up. So it couldn't be completely full moon. So, you know, we did some calculations. This was in February and we decided that on May 8th, it could happen so that, but then on May 8th, it was cloudy. So then I went on May 9th and lo and behold, of course, there was not a single soul for this, for this event. Um, and then next day, actually, I learned that a lot of people were at Yosemite Falls because they were trying to capture the, you know, the moonlight rainbow. And, and while there was a crowd over there, I was here just, you know, live, you know, photographing this experience all by myself. We did some calculations. We learned that by June something, the same year, it could be a repeat. And the waterfall probably didn't have enough water, but, you know, it might be worth a try. And guess what? When I went there that night, there were already about five, six people. <laughs> so the boys, you know, the rumors go fast. And uh, that's it for me. That's my little presentation about everything else about astrophotography. Y'all can unmute. <laughs> yeah, I don't hear a thing. <laughs> Let's see. I have no unmute all but Maybe you have admin powers. So. I was wondering. Release them all. I think my jaw's still on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
I'm not worthy. Yeah. Rahelio, is oh, your gallery you. ever open? Say that again. Is your gallery ever open? Well, you, because it's in my house, <laughs> it's not re, it's not retail. You'll need to tell me first. But yeah, you tell me first. We make an appointment. Um, I'll need to check with the boss of the house with this COVID thing, but it should be workable. I would think. <laughs> okay. You can make like what? a video of it or something. <laughs> you can post. It. Yeah. Virtual tour. Yeah, well, I'm with a laptop. Otherwise, I will move the camera around to see a little bit. <laughs> So you closed your retail gallery then? Because I know at one point you had a retail gallery, right? Well, we were. I was going to open a retail gallery. This was in, in on the Big Island in Hawaii. Oh, oh. Uh, yeah. Actually, I moved there for that very reason. Um, but things didn't work out. Let's just uh, let's just say that my partner and I didn't come to a good understanding. Um, I'll tell you the true story of, uh, <laughs> under the stars. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it didn't work out. So then, you know, I came back to California. He actually opened the gallery and he closed four months later. I wasn't very sad about that. I was more sad about other things. Um, but so you know, for me, it never really happened retail. But then when I came back, that's when I decided to do, to do this one. I thought at one point I saw on your Deep Sky Color site something about having a gallery in Sunnyvale, but I guess I mis misread it or something. Well, it probably was this one. I may not have been specific about, you know, being retail or not. Okay, I, I, I recorded this and I'm going to go ahead and kill the recording now so we're off the record. <laughs>